Okay, our next contestant tonight is Lewis Evans. <laughs> Lewis is a writer, speaker, comedian, and primate. He is honored to present for the second time at the Bold and Accurate Hypothesis Festival, because he's pretty sure that's what the acronym stands for. <laughs> it's been said, you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. And, well, you can't argue with the truth. How do I sound? Am I coming through good? All right, today we'll be discussing the human eye, or more accurately, the human eyes. Humans have two eyes, and that's pretty common. <laughs> All other vertebrates have two eyes, and so do the cephalopods. However, in humans and other primates, both eyes are located next to each other, on um, the front of the head. This is a phenomenon that scientists like me call adjacent eye placement. <laughs> and it's less common than you might think. In fact, it's downright rare. The overwhelming majority of vertebrates do not have adjacent eye placement. And that makes sense. Having both eyes in the same location on the head is dangerous. It gives you a huge blind spot on the other side of your head, an area that in humans we refer to as the back of the head. <laughs> and that blind spot leaves you acutely vulnerable to predators, <laughs> to accidents, and to rivals of the same species. <laughs> in fact, in nature, we find that only four major groups of organisms have adjacent eye placement. There's the pleuronectiforms, or flatfish. There's strigiforms, which you may know as owls, along with other birds of prey. Carnivora, a group that includes cats, dogs, and bears. And primates. Of these four, it's easy to explain adjacent eye placement in the first three. But with primates, it's a little bit more mysterious. Let's begin with pleuronectiforms, or flatfish. Flatfish have both eyes on the same side of their body because they spend their entire life lying on the benthos, the sea floor, in the same position. There's no risky blind spot because the sea floor quite literally has their back, and so their eyes have migrated to the top of the body. In primates, this strategy <laughs> is less effective. In this figure, we see our lab assistant, Gerald, testing the flatfish life strategy among humans. I can report, but it probably won't surprise you, that this strategy interferes with human hunting, eating, and mating behaviors. <laughs> Gerald is not an evolutionary success. Strigiforms and other birds of prey have adjacent eyes because this gives them something called binocular vision, which is when both eyes can focus on the same object across a wide area of the visual field. This enhances depth perception, and that's important when you're hunting prey from the sky. But primates who take to the sky do not achieve <laughs> reproductive or evolutionary success. <laughs> Carnivora have adjacent eyes for much the same reason. They use binocular vision to hunt large prey from a distance. But depth perception is not essential for primate eating behavior. <laughs> so why then do primates have adjacent eye placement? Well, some say that we evolved adjacent eyes to spot and eat insects. But when we look at other insectivores, they do not typically evolve adjacent eye placement. Consider the aardvark. Its diet consists exclusively of ants and termites, and its eyes are not adjacent, except in fictional instances. <laughs> PBS has dangerously misled the public about the key facts of aardvark eye location. <laughs> so the adaptive benefits other clades achieve with adjacent eye placement don't apply to humans, and we've debunked the insectivore hypothesis. But there is one real benefit to adjacent eye placement in primates. It enables a key social behavior known as asymmetric ocular occultation, or winking. And winking is a remarkably powerful adaptation because it permits secret directional communication. Primitive primates, and indeed primates today, are social creatures. And social creatures derive a great deal of utility from communicating. But more than that, they derive a great deal of utility from being able to privately communicate with selected members of the species. They might convey useful information to allies, share resources with mates or children, or they might make reproductive arrangements to which the entire troop is not invited. But vocalizations and gestures are not secret. 
any nearby member of the species can observe them and intercept the message. And in the adaptive environment, opportunities for private communication are few and far between. There's no Snapchat for marmosets. But any animal with two forward-facing eyes can wink. That's not so for animals without such forward-facing eyes. Consider this horse. Unlike a human, its eyes are on opposite sides of the head. Now, watch closely. Did that horse wink at you, or did it merely blink? It's impossible for us to know. <laughs> Even the saucy smile of this individual can't answer the question for us. But with any organism where the eyes are on the same side of the head, we'd know immediately. Adjacent eye placement makes it much easier to distinguish between a meaningful wink and an innocent blink. And that allowed primitive primates to communicate secretly. The adaptive benefits of secret communication helped move primate eyes from the side of the skull to the front of the head, an area that we today know as the face, where winks are less ambiguous, more directional, and more effective. And this evolutionary legacy of the wink is still visible today. A wink continues to connote friendship, a proposed sexual liaison, or a secret plan to murder. <laughs> or, as in this case, all three at once. So now we understand the evolutionary history of primate adjacent eye placement, but this is more than an abstract fact about natural history. Understanding the nature of winking can enable us to save our planet. We live in a period of unprecedented ecological disaster. From pollution, to climate change, to overconsumption. From natural disasters, to hunting, to Benedict Cumberbatch, our species <laughs> and our ecosystems are under threat. <laughs> Unfortunately, though we need to come together and save all of our ecosystems, charitable support and other efforts are focused overwhelmingly on just a handful of charismatic megafauna species. Now what makes megafauna charismatic? That's right, they can wink. <laughs> our attachment to winking leaves other, less charismatic, threatened animals out in the cold. Of course, as we can see from their expression, these guys have no problem with keeping the lion's share of the donor money to themselves. But where does that leave less charismatic species like the South American yellow-footed tortoise? This animal is a keystone species in the Amazon ecosystem, and it's seriously threatened by both hunting and deforestation. But nobody cares about it just because its eyes aren't on the same side of its head. With technology, we can change that. With this simple prosthetic, we can make the tortoise wink capable, raising its profile and giving new hope to conservationists everywhere. Let's see one of these bad boys in action. There it goes. Don't you feel yourself more moved to donate to this handsome fellow already? Imagine, yes, applaud for the yellow-footed tortoise. Save it with your love. Imagine the impact on the American, and indeed the global public, if every yellow-footed tortoise in the Amazon was known to be sporting one of these snazzy get-ups. Unfortunately, the fuddy-duddies at the World Wildlife Foundation don't have the one-eyed vision to appreciate this breakthrough, and they've refused to fund our research of, or deployment of, wink prosthetic technology. That's why we founded a new organization, the Winking Wildlife Foundation. <laughs> we've set an ambitious goal, one pair of googly glasses for every endangered animal on Earth. <laughs> we need your help. We need your support. Please, pledge to our Kickstarter today. With 23,000 endangered species, times 100 individuals per species, times $4 per eye, times, most importantly, two eyes per head, we need a mere $18 million. In exchange for your support, you'll receive items like this striking t-shirt, or a wink prosthetic of your very own which you can use on a domestic animal, or perhaps an unsympathetic child. And remember, together we can save the world one wink at a time. Thank you. And especially thanks to Katie Morton. Without her, every endangered animal would be dead in a week. Well, that was a very passionate proposal. Uh, Gail. So you noted that winking is often important in courtship, and so I'm, I'm curious whether this could be important in mate choice, whether, for example, females could assess the quality of a potential mate through the um, 
quality and winking. So what kind of variability do you see among individuals in this behavior? Yeah, so among primates, social primates like humans, uh, wink quality is uh, correlated with mate selection opportunities by uh, over 95%. Um, people who can't wink uh, simply, simply don't reproduce. Uh, it's sort of an evolutionary mystery how we produce wink-incapable offspring, uh, whether that's novel mutations in each generation, um, because with that level of selective pressure, you would expect that to fall out of the gene pool right away. Uh, all we know as a matter of historical fact is that uh, George Costanza postdates uh, James Dean, so the wink, wink failure genes must somehow persist. They might correlate <laughs> with other adaptive benefits, like higher levels of face symmetry. Excellent. Uh, Maggie? So, so as I understand it, you were saying that non-wink capable primates do not reproduce. But if that is the case, how do you explain the phenomenon documented by Falwell 2015, where they found spontaneous eye placement shift in postpartum primate females. Where do second children come from, sir? <laughs> well, presumably it shifts back, right? It, there are a lot of features among primates that signal, and among all mammal species and many species, that signal availability to reproduce or not. Uh, with primates, uh, or at least with humans, I know that during the period of lactation you get suppression of ovulation. So clearly there are adaptive benefits uh, to uh, not immediately reproducing right after gestation. Uh, presumably, if you're not going to immediately reproduce, there are benefits to avoiding uh, unnecessary uh, sexual coupling, uh, which is a waste of everyone's time uh, from Darwin's <laughs> perspective. Um, and so I can only assume that uh, postpartum females uh, spontaneously developed eye shifts in order to signal their unavailability uh, and that subsequently they relocated. And in fact, unless these researchers were examining only uh, prima gravidas, which is to say mothers having their first offspring, um, we would expect that the phenomenon strength would be stronger if the eyes are relocating over the weaning period. So I think I can only assume that the report I haven't read yet backs up my hypothesis in every particular. <laughs> We have one more question from Carl. I'm deeply concerned <laughs> at this Panglossian adaptationist scenario. <laughs> have you considered that this could be a spandrel? Have you, have you tried to reject Professor Mnookin's hypothesis that our eyes are merely in front of our heads so that we can put headphones on our ears and listen to music comfortably? <laughs> Yeah, um, so that is a real concern, especially given the role that headphones play in mate selection. Um, and so what we've done is we've done reproductive testing in uh, isolated populations with only access to gramophones. Um, and we were able to identify uh, wink-related benefits uh, even before the invention of the headphone. Um, there was also some genealogical research that went into that. So we consider that substantially rejected. Uh, I'm happy to expound on that further if you'd like me to send along some of our preliminary notes. Well, that's good Very for good. now.